Hi, this is Knit, Fix, and Chill with Jen and Bess, a podcast for knitters who want to go deeper. We are here to share our perspectives on techniques, on fit, on creativity, and other industry topics. And we are so glad that you're joining us. I'm Bess. I am a knitwear designer and artist. Uh, I usually go by Elizabeth Margaret if you are looking for me and my designs. My designs really focus on reclaiming the feminine aesthetic for feminist values and uh, they do that through the lens of size inclusive garments that highlight your own unique inner beauty. And this is Jen. Take it away. Yeah, this is Jen. Um, so I'm Jen Parasini. I'm a knitwear designer educator and consultant in the knitwear design space. Um, I'm really focused on garments that reflect your identity, fit exactly the way that you think they will, and never hit the closet floor. So I believe everybody deserves that abundance and I'm here to help you get it. And today we are gonna be talking about substituting yarn. We're gonna do a little bit of a deep dive into um, how cotton behaviors, how cotton fabric behaves, and we're gonna talk some about pilling and uh yeah should we get to it let's get to it thank you for joining okay so let's get started for today um Bess, what's your tea all right well my tea literally is a throat coat slippery elm and it is already covered in lipstick. Um, and <laughs> it's doing me right, I have to say. It's a little too hot, but I'm happy about it. Um, and what's on my mind this week? I am launching my Hypatia pullover right now. So as we're recording this, I'm in the pre-launch period, but by the time this comes out, it will be sort of freshly just released. And I'm making some decisions right now about whether I am going to keep both of the samples that I've made in the pattern um, or if I'm going to cut one because I used different yarns. We're going to talk about this more later. Um, but the finished samples look so very different because the yarns that I used, although they were a similar weight, um, really have different properties. So I just checked and measured and they are in fact the same size, but um, they fit like very different sized garments. Have you ever had that happen? Um, no, because I don't knit sweaters more than once. Although I'm trying to make an <laughs> exception. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> Real talk, hates it, <laughs> not my style. <laughs> like, I want to be somebody who um, knits the same sample over and over. And when I was first learning to design, I did because I was doing kids' patterns and I felt like I could do that. Um, but now, mm -mm. I have so many other things I want to do. So, yeah, I understand. You'll have to keep me posted. Yeah. Um, but I'm trying to make an exception. Um, like you, I mean, we're talking about yarn subs today because it's something that's been on our mind a lot, right? Um, so I actually have cast on a second sample of this little tea. Um, if knitting a second sample, the same set or twice, is ever going to work with me, it's going to work with an in-the-round seamless short sleeve raglan, right? Like, that's my best yeah. odds. <laughs> I can do this. Um, but I knit this sample using an alpaca uh, cotton blend and... It's not that it's itchy so much as it's constantly like, Psst, I'm here, I'm here, you're wearing me, I'm here, I'm here. And like yeah. for me, that's like sensory overload. I just can't have my shirt talking to me all day long. And so I'm excited for this topic because we're going to talk about cotton and that's the rabbit hole and yarn subs and that's the rabbit hole I also have been going down. So yeah. It yeah. is, uh, it's quite a rabbit hole to get into and we've got a lot to talk about and not a lot of time, but I think we have some letters from knitters and I would like to hear them. So do you want to read them for us? I want to read them to you. Okay. So I have two reader letters. Um, and PS, if you want to hear us talk about something, hop on the newsletter so that we can hear from you so that we can read your letters out and respond to you. 
Um, so this one's from B. So she said, um, how do you substitute plant fibers for another plant fiber? I have a pattern that I'm excited to knit, and I'd like to keep the original suggestion of a mohair plus cotton, but I'm thinking of using modal or silk, both of which feel more slippery than cotton. Should I get cotton and just knit for the pattern, or would it be all right to make that sub? Um, so thank you for sending that, B. And then from Jocelyn in New Zealand, we have, in choosing yarn for a garment, how can I know if that yarn is prone to pilling? I like four ply, fingering weight, but I have found that those lovely soft yarns do tend to pill. I have a gleaner and can deal with that, but I would like to minimize the problem when I make my initial choice. Um, I suspect knowing the properties of particular breeds may help. Uh, I have discovered that Cordale tends not to pill so much. Are there other breeds to consider? So thank you both for sending those in. Um, and I think today we're mostly going to talk uh, anecdotally, right? We're going to share some of our experiences. And as we walk through those, we'll be sharing a lot of the things that are in our minds as we do make yarn substitutions. Because it's a really big deal. It is a big deal. And when you're switching out your yarn, you can end up with really a completely different garment than the one um, perhaps in the pattern picture, right? Because the properties and the characteristics of a yarn are going to create a certain fabric and when you're working with different fabrics um if you're a sewist which i'm not so i've had to learn this stuff as a knitter which i think takes longer but it's still in the end you get there right as well you're knitter, making the fabric so yeah it takes longer yeah. yeah exactly as a knitter we're making fabric a sewist is just using fabric and the type of fabric that you use is really um, at least half of the design, right? So the shape of the actual garment is one thing, and then the fabric that it's made out of is the other piece of that puzzle that determines what something looks like when you put it on a body. So let's start and jump in. Um, I'll talk... Do you want me to talk a little bit about what's on my mind with Hypatia right now? Let's because... just get right into Hypatia because I see that you're wearing it. It's a super fun neckline. It's a very Thank versatile you. sweater. And it sounds yeah. like there are things you want to change. Well, so long, long story, <laughs> slightly less long. story long. medium. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> um, I started this sweater as a redesign of one of my first sweater patterns. And when I first designed the original sweater, which was called May, um, the, you know, the gathers were not quite how I envisioned them because I was learning different techniques to do that. And the size inclusivity really wasn't where I wanted it, which we'll talk about probably in our next episode. Um, I was a brand new designer then. And so now that I'm feeling a little more like perhaps a designer who's gotten their feet wet after a few years here, I'm going back and cleaning up these patterns. And so this is like a sweatshirt design. It is um, meant to have the feminine vibe that I have, but in a pretty subtle way. So it has these gathers that you see mostly from the side or from the back, right? This original sample is knit with um, our friend of the podcast, Larissa from Forest Lane Fiber Company. Um, this is her BFL DK. I'm pretty sure this colorway is called Pink Oysters Pink Clouds, although I feel like I often get the words wrong. <laughs> and it's just this beautiful speckled colorway. And BFL is um, blue faced. Lester? If Lester? Jen knows that, Lester? I can't, I can't ever say this word. <laughs> Lester. Thank you. <laughs> it's like a funny old guy outside of a convenience store. It's Lester. That's I, how I remember right. it. I just really People want can to tell me pronounce I'm wrong. <laughs> the C in the middle there and you don't, uh, you don't really pronounce it. Um, so this yarn in particular is lovely. It's got a lot of drape for a wool which is why I thought it would do, this pattern would hold up pretty well to another yarn that would have drape, right? So when we talk about drape, that means um, how 
how heavily the yarn, the fabric falls, right? Is that how you would describe drape? Yeah, you know, a lot of knitting properties, I put them opposite each, opposite of each other. So like, I think of um, drape and body as being on opposite sides of a scale. So one that's right. more drape is going to be more flowy, and one with more body is going to be more puffy, standy, outy. Those are the technical terms. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Thank <laughs> you. Thanks for jumping in with that tech talk. <laughs> puffy, standy, outy. <laughs> so, so wool in general, right, is puffy and it doesn't usually cling to your body or fall in a natural sort of ripple unless like these gathers are sewn in to create a little bit of that ripple. It's a seamless garment and then you just like pinch them in there at the end. Um, you work increases when you're making it, blah, blah, blah. So uh, BFL is a wool that has drape like for a wool. This is a non superwash non-superwash yarn also has less drape than superwash yarn usually and um, BFL is on the drapey side of wool but really probably still on the body side of a larger spectrum. This is where I got a little bit thrown myself because it is um, it's hard to pin down like one specific fiber where it's gonna fall on that range. Yeah. Now, I wanted to show this sweater in um, a more like budget-friendly, accessible yarn, and um, I've also included like a crop length and crop sleeves. So I was like, "All right, I'm gonna knit another sample in the crop size." I love high-waisted bottoms anyway, so crops are great for me. Um, and I got Barocco DK, uh, what is it? Barocco Remix, or Barocco Remix Light is the DK, I believe. <laughs> uh, you can find this in the show notes. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> so Barocco Remix, it comes in a, in a couple of different um, weights, right? So they have a Remix, Remix Light, there may be others. Uh, it's a recycled yarn, which is cool, and it is recycled with several different fibers. There mm -hmm. is acrylic in there, I believe there's cotton and linen and like viscose or something that is um, like a nylon. Acry yeah, mm -hmm. like an acrylic. And so it has a, a lot of different things going on, which means that it can be hard to predict. The texture yeah. of it is a little bit nubby. So I felt it would be like an okay sub for this pattern, especially meeting the criteria that I wanted, which was if I'm going to have another yarn in this pattern, I want it to be one that people can find and can make, you know, in a really reasonable price because I, have this value that like these yarns are underrated, right? So a few things have happened. One, uh, my skin is quite sensitive, especially like my chest and my neck. And I find both BFL and this particular um, mix yarn to be like a little bit prickly without something underneath them. So I wasn't sure. I actually feel like the, the BFL is less prickly than remix but you know that's a personal thing that's sure subjective. yeah um so both of them i'm happy wearing with something underneath them but i wouldn't wear either of them next to my skin and when i initially tried them both on next to my skin it's like the remix felt like a little uncomfortable and i think turned me off to that sample a little bit which I hate to say it like that, but we've all had that experience, right? Like you try something on, it doesn't feel quite how you wanted it to feel. Oh yeah, we're gonna. <laughs> I have so much to say about this. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Well, let me finish <laughs> <laughs> so that we can get there. Um, so also because the remix has more drape, it doesn't look the same particularly in the sleeves and in like the gather, I feel like 
these gathers are working in this shape because they have body, right? Because they're yeah. standing out from my arm a little. And so it makes it feel like a sweatshirt. And from mm -hmm. the front, it almost just looks like a, a sweatshirt, right? But then from like the side and these gathers on me show up a little better on the back, the way I seem to them, um, you see like, oh, that's cute. There's this feminine aesthetic, right? Yeah. Uh, whereas the drapier fabric, I am losing the gather a little bit. I have worked with how I seamed them. So I was talking to Jen earlier today and I was like, I don't know, maybe I'm not even gonna include this other sample in the photos. But now I'm back to maybe I am because after reseaming the gathers so that they stood out a little more, it looked better to me. Um, so this is going to be airing after I've already released this pattern, but that'll be a surprise. You guys are going to have It's a surprise for all of us. Yeah. <laughs> surprise. <laughs> I don't know right now if I'm going to, I'm going to photograph it and decide at that point. Um, because what's happening is that with more drape, it doesn't look as much like a sweatshirt. I was even feeling like it was not the same size, although I got gauge, you mm -hmm. know, of course I started there. Um, but the fit is so different between a drapey fabric and a floofier fabric that I was like, is this smaller? Um, yeah. because when you add that weight and drape, your excess fabric, fabric is going to move and sit differently. So you're not going to have as much even ease, even if your garment is knit with even ease, or it won't necessarily appear like that. Would you say that's? Yeah. Like a, yeah. And I feel like a little bit of what you're talking about here is another property that I know you and I are both evaluating when we're making designs and that's like loftiness, right? So for this property, yeah. I would say you have lofty on one side and like clingy on the other. Right. So and lofty is like how much air is in the mm -hmm. fiber, right? Yeah. And so if your remix is a mix of cotton and acrylic and some wool and some other stuff, you know, it's a little bit harder to predict how much air is in that yarn. And it mm. might be a little bit clingier, whereas something that's lofty is going to have its own shape. Like in the most extreme version, something lofty might even like stand up on its own a little bit. And it's going to yeah. stand away from the body, right? So the, the high body, high loft um, product that you have with this sample, I can see being difficult to duplicate in a, um, in a fabric with a different fiber especially like such a blend. And when we're talking about loftiness, you know, like wool is on the loftier side and then basically everything else is less lofty than that. There's not a lot of other fibers that have a lot of air in them. Um, I mean, other types of animal fibers like Angora or mm. cashmere, which is like not technically wool. Is wool only from sheep? I think wool is only from a sheep. I think it's right? only from sheep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Someone let us know if we're wrong about that. <laughs> um, but, you know, certainly like denser fibers have less air in them. Things like linen and cotton are pretty dense and acrylic tends to have like no loft in it because it is not porous, right? Because it is made from like a plastic. So things like viscose, rayon, acrylic, any of those man-made fibers. Um, that is one of the reasons people feel kind of mad about them. If you do, they have a place just like everything else. Um, mm -hmm. And acrylic can be manufactured in different ways to make it seem like wool, but it will not have that same breathability and air in it without some sort of processing to try and make it that way. That's right. So, so yeah. what about you? I want to hear about your itchy, your prickly situation. It's chatty. See, for a sweater, it's a chatty sweater. <laughs> right. So a chatty sweater that's like long sleeve and I'm wearing it like a sweatshirt. I'm like, oh, okay. Great excuse to wear a high necked leotard. <laughs> but I don't know if I would feel that way about a tee. Have yeah. I mean, hot take. Are we asking too much from knitting these days? Right. So like, 
as knitting has really become such a ubiquitous hobby over the last 10 years, people really want things that they can wear as if they're t-shirts. They want easy, fast construction. They want things that mm -hmm. they can just slip on and go. Um, and we're asking a lot from our fibers, right? So I've really enjoyed seeing your sweater today that you have a leotard like layered underneath of it, because I think that that's a really reasonable approach to wearing more fibers. Mm -hmm. It doesn't help us substitute, but um, it's also and there, a good there, approach there are... to wearing more leotards. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have questions for you and about how you go through your day with a leotard and I will ask them off air. Um, <laughs> I have answers. I <laughs> I'm sure you do. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there are other reasons to make a sub other than sensory stuff, right? Like I know I work with a lot of people internationally who can't necessarily get the same yarns that I can get in the U.S. Or, mm. you know, sometimes we do really beautiful projects with dyers who do small batches. Um, yeah. Or sometimes people have different budgets than I do. So yeah, I or I live in Florida, y'all. So I sometimes <sighs> don't want another wool garment. There's only, you know, so many days a year that I'm going to wear wool in a tropical climate, but it has no. its place in my wardrobe still. Work in four sweaters a day every time you have to go outside to squeeze them in. <laughs> a different one every time I walk my dog. <laughs> yes. And I am beginning to be a woman of a particular age. And so I also am preferring lighter and lighter fabrics. And so I thought, you know what I want to do this year is I really want to knit myself a fingering weight raglan that's very classic, very riffable, um, because I don't have a lot of t-shirts and I really don't want to buy fast fashion ones. Um, and also fast fashion well, yeah. t-shirts are all like straight up and down from the hips to the underarm no, and girl, I'm not, they're terrible. And even if you want like a drop sleeve square tee, which I have and wear, um, you don't want one that is just going to look like trash after you wash it like once. And yeah, I make great use of knit tees. I love them. I have knit tees in my design process right now and um some that i've released and there will be more you know a cotton yeah. knit tee a cotton knit tee i think is um really delivers on this big promise that people want from their knits of being yeah. like fast easy throw it on throw it in the wash it accidentally goes through the dryer you're probably okay um, yeah yeah but, but I've I been afraid it, to work with cotton, right? Like I, this is my first sweater that I have designed that even has a cotton component. And my mm -hmm. reasons for that is like my association of cotton is that it's very heavy because it is, um, that it doesn't have mm -hmm. a lot of body or squish or bounce, um, which are all properties that I love in wool. And mm -hmm. it doesn't, um, and it can be hard, plant fibers can be hard on the hands for people who have joint issues like me. So uh, every time I've worked with cotton before, my experience has been like, this is a real drag to knit with. The experience of knitting with it has been unpleasant, um, but I had never worked with fingering weight cotton before. So I was like, I will choose something that's a cotton blend. I will choose a more affordable yarn than some of the indie dyers I've been working with recently. And I found this, um, this cotton, it's 65% organic cotton and 35% alpaca. And I thought mm -hmm. that what I was going to get was like going to be a baby alpaca and that it would be really wearable for me. And it's not, it's not that it's itchy. Well, I think it said super fine, right? Which it did. we're going to have to drop into that for a sec, but keep going. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, it was not what I expected when I knit it up and that became real apparent when I blocked it and it started to do its natural thing. Cause we all know that blocking is what will tell us how a yarn will ultimately behave. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's beautiful. I can wear it, but it's not the t-shirt experience I was going for. And so I have been experiencing um, or experimenting with 100% cotton yarns for the first time. I love um, it. So you're, you're winning me over. Welcome. Yeah. Welcome <laughs> to the washable side, to the warm yeah. weather knitting side. Well, so cotton is a big umbrella right and there's a lot of different kinds of cotton and some of them are going to have more body so yeah is that what you're finding that you're enjoying certain like certain cottons are not uh maybe perhaps y'all you can tell this is my first time podcasting right i'm like <laughs> that so <laughs> what i'm trying to ask you yeah are you finding some cottons that defy those expectations you had that kind of kept you from using them in the past 
Yeah. And so one of my terrors was I've worked with linen and I just can't ever get anybody else's gauge with linen. Like no matter what I do, those stitches yeah. just get wider. They never get any taller. Um, linen so is a I, difficult fiber. Yeah. Yeah. I have been scared of cotton thinking it would do the same thing because it's a plant fiber. And no, what I have found is I have a skein of yarn that has the exact same put up as this fiber, same mm -hmm. number of yards, 100% cotton. And this is an organic cotton. And the way it knits up is very similar um, for our audio only listeners. I have a little swatch that is um, cream and purple. And then I also am wearing a t-shirt that is like an oatmeal sesame color. Um, the drape is very similar. This is a, a little bit less drapey than alpaca, which makes sense because alpaca is a very slippery, slippery, light mm -hmm. fabric. Um, but it's going to make a beautiful, perfect t-shirt. And one of the ways that we measure drape right would be to hold up a swatch and so when i hold this up um it doesn't quite plop over right away like it's not like liquid pouring out of my hand but it's not also to use your words to me once it's not like a paper towel right it's not sticking straight mm -hmm. out so it's really it's a medium drape fabric which is very similar to what i've had um and i'm finding that knitting with an organic cotton feels almost like working with a very super fine yarn in comparison to this other skein i got um that is, I'm going to hold this up to the camera. It's a little bit glossier. Um, mm -hmm. And so this is Pima cotton. And it feels to me in my hands a little bit more like a hank of um, embroidery floss. So it doesn't, when I squish it, it doesn't have the same like, density and balance that the organic right. cotton has. Neither one of them rivals wool. But in terms of um, the comparison between the two, um, the individual strands of the Pima feel harder. You've worked with different kinds of cottons. Do you have a favorite? Organic cotton is my favorite for sure. Um, I also really like, sometimes you'll find cotton in a chainette construction, usually at a denser weight, like a worsted weight. And I have used that and really liked it as well because that puts a lot of air back into the fiber. Yeah. So a chainette construction is when there are like a million little crochet chains making up the strand. And you can even find um, like an end and pull it and unravel it, right? So yeah. I've used that in a situation like a dress where the regular cotton, which is usually many, many, many plies and fairly heavy, it would have um, been too heavy and stretched. So that's one of the big issues with cotton is that it can stretch a lot when you're using a lot of fabric. Um, organic cotton, though, like you're saying, it has more body than, um, especially than like a Pima cotton. Pima cotton behaves a little bit more like, like linen almost, where linen is so stiff that that makes it quite hard on your hands if you do have sensitivities. And also um, that I think is why you like have trouble getting engaged with linen because it's trying to bend itself not necessarily. Yeah, it wants to be like a straight flow. line. It wants to be a stick. Yeah. <laughs> it wants this to feels be, to yeah. me like a um like a the drape of a organic cotton at this gauge, which is a fairly open gauge, but it's a medium gauge. Um, feels to me like a swatch that I have knit of wool and spun merino. Yes, and when we talk about wool, right? Wool and spun. Well, any yarn, but when we're talking about wool particularly, wool and spun is when it's like a looser, fluffier spin, and worsted mm -hmm. spun is a tighter, uh, tighter twist. Correct? Yeah, all the fibers are um, oriented together in um, worsted spun, whereas in wool and spun, it's more like a fluff pile that's been convinced to be a string. Yeah, yeah. which. This brings us pretty naturally into talking about pilling as well, because the tighter that the twist of a yarn is, the less likely it is to pill, since pilling really happens when like loose ends of the yarn and loose bits of the yarn are falling out of the open spaces between the plies. Yeah, that's that a really good description. Yeah. <laughs> it's fibers escaping. Yeah, they're getting out. Yeah, they're like escaping. Yeah. So the twist of the yarn and the amount of plies are both going to affect that. So Jocelyn said particularly that she likes four ply, which sometimes that is like used to mean fingering weight. Yeah, um, especially where she lives. Yeah. 
Yes. And sometimes that is not, sometimes the plies are not going to correspond with the weight, but traditionally a fingering yeah. weight is four plies, four strands of yarn, right? So those four strands, if it were a fingering weight yarn that were eight strands, it would pill less. Um, also what has a big impact, I would say two other big impacts are the length of the fiber, the length of the staple, each staple. Yeah. In, fi like in, in fiber animals, it's called the staple. Um, mm -hmm. We don't know what the length of the fiber is called in plant fibers, but whatever it is, when you tease out a single right. individual strand from your yarn, how long is that? That fiber length is going to determine some, some of Which, those like, important properties cotton, of filling. So like the thing about plant fibers is that I don't really think you can. So I'm like... I know that some of the cotton I've worked with, if you try and separate the ply, it's just like the whole thing. We need a botanist. So, yes. Yeah. <laughs> that's going to be a future episode all about plant fibers. A botanist but... tells us all about how cotton grows out of <laughs> yeah. the, and cotton, the bowl. Cotton can still <laughs> pill because it can still shed like fluff, especially mm -hmm. a fluffier cotton, but it is plant fibers are typically not going to pill anywhere close to as much as uh, animal fibers because animal fibers have that staple length or that staple that is um, shorter than the total length of your yarn. And so some um, wool and some animal fibers have shorter still staples and that would be like cashmere, like angora, like these super soft yarns are going to pill the most. And that's one of the reasons I feel like, not to put words in your mouth, Jen, you're saying like, are we expecting too much? Because we all love super, super soft yarn and like a single ply fluffy cashmere would be like the softest yarn you would touch in the yarn shop. But would you actually love wearing a sweater made out of that yarn because it's going to pill and it's not going to wear as well as other uh, wool or fiber, right? Yeah, I have an Angora shawl that like I never wear because it makes me sneeze like mad. And it's not because I'm allergic to rabbits. Um, it's because it just, it's like, it's like Charlie Brown's just, pig pen. It's just yeah, a it's cloud just of fibers at all times. So yeah. Um, yeah, and also like the more, the less irritating those fibers are, the more they're going to pill because what makes fibers irritating is their coarseness um, mm -hmm. and the fact that animal fibers have scales. Like, so you've got the shaft of the fiber and it has scales on it. Um, mm -hmm. And the angle of those scales and the overall dimension of the hair shaft itself with the scales included, um, both are things that contribute to the stickiness of those fibers and keeping them integrated into your yarn. So, and the size of the scale itself, right? Which yeah, I don't know as much about the size of the scales. I know I more know about... that like finer yarns have finer scale, like merino and cashmere have m much smaller scales than like, um, you know, Leicester, Leicester, <laughs> or even some of the yarns that like. I want to say like Coriadale, but even most of the yarns that I would name right now are going to be fairly soft. Um, but the scratchier yarn, scratchier wool has a big scale. Mm. I know more about like the overall, I've been able to um, appease my sensitive skin by looking at the overall micron count. So the overall width of the fiber. Yeah. Micron I don't know as much about scales. magic everybody yeah. and yeah. not necessarily talked about enough. The micron count is really the overall softness of the fiber, correct? Yeah. So it's the width, right? And so the wider, mm -hmm. the bigger a chunk is in your yarn, um, the more you're going to feel it and notice it. Um, and feeling and noticing is what makes, you know, it's what makes those little nerve signals go from your skin to your brain to say, hey, we have a situation mm -hmm. here. There's something touching me. Um, so yeah, yeah and so I wish you... I, I was going to say, I wish the micron count were more easily, 
available for any yarn. Like when I'm buying a yarn, I wish I could see the micron count when I was purchasing it. Um, I hope one day that there is a movement that that happens. If you don't know, also, I think it's right around 20, 21 is like the marker that most of the time people give to say below 20 is a soft yarn and above 20 is not so soft. Yeah, 20 and below, most people, even with sensitive skin, they'll be aware they're wearing a sweater, but it probably won't be a problem. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but like the, but so there, like the narrower those fibers are, the more easily they're going to escape from the fiber. The fewer scales they have, or um, the more closely aligned those scales are to the shaft. So, like alpaca, the angle of the scales to the shaft is um, lower. So, um, they're just more easily able to escape from that fiber. So both of those things that make yarns more wearable are things that make those yarns more easy to pill. My favorite sweater to wear is one that pills more than others. Um, and it is a very super fine, probably around an 18, 19 micron count, um, mm-hmm. non super wash yarn. Um, and it does pill more than others and it is so worth it for me. Yeah, some of my favorite sweaters that I wear a lot also pill a lot because they're really soft and I'm okay with that. Um, I will grab a gleaner. Uh, some of the, there's another factor which can reduce pilling that we're not really talking about, which is that if yarn is super wash, it's probably not going to pill as much because I've had the oh, opposite experience. Oh, really? Yeah. My super washes pill way more. Mm-hmm. I think because they're more slippery. I think because, okay, so the superwash process, right? And I don't knit a ton of garments with superwash, but I have a few. Um, Mm -hmm. The superwash process, for anyone who doesn't know, reduces the impact of those scales. Felting is caused in the wash um, when those scales lock up together. There are two ways to deal with this. Um, One is by filling the gaps between the shaft and the scales with a polymer, right? Those will be the superwash yarns if you've used them and they feel more plump. Um, and more slick for their weight, maybe than others. Mm. A lot, um, this is how most superwash is done. Um, and then there is um, chemically stripping the scales off, which creates a very slippery fiber. And that I think is less common. And there is like a greener way to do it with, um, is it done with lanolin? I forget what it is, but it's so infrequent that you see that, that uh, that's gonna be a rare fiber for people to find. Yeah, um, so, I'm thinking of my letters from the open road, which I test knit. That's your design I test knit mm-hmm. a, last year. And that's a super wash, and I wear it a ton, and it does not pill. Do you want to but know why? It has nylon, right? That's is not that, why. Why is it? Is it um, it's of because of all the extra tension in the stitches, right? Mm. So. The tighter anything is, the less fibers are going to escape. And letters to camp is knitted a really dense gauge in a stitch texture, a knit pearl stitch texture. So that yarn's under a lot of tension. Okay, that makes so sense. So more density, the more dense something is, the more tight those stitches are, the less stuff can escape and all mm-hmm. that tension. And you can add tension and structure in a multitude of ways, right? So um, yes, cable I used that stitches. technique for mm-hmm. my Jane dress. Jane is a herringbone stitch, which is technically a lace, but doesn't look like a lace. And it does create a pretty dense fabric as well. So I'm yeah. hoping that will prevent pilling on the butt of this dress. <laughs> yeah, nobody wants a fuzzy butt. <laughs> I mean, not in public. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Okay, so I think that maybe like a summary would be to say, look at the properties of the sweater, which properties of the sweater are a product of the yarn, Mm -hmm. right? And then what are the properties of that yarn? And then where else can you find them? Yeah. So if we have a high drape sweater, mm -hmm. I was going to say, and, or if you change the property of that yarn, how will the shape of the garment be impacted. So does the garment itself, because perhaps um, you have a a fairly simple sweater and if you're going to swap a wool for a cotton or something else, it might not make a difference if we're talking about like a fairly 
straightforward design that doesn't have a ton of ease. But the more style or I shouldn't say style, but like flair aesthetic, the more that a designer has used that fabric to create something like gathers or poof or um, ruffles, etc. cetera, um, mm -hmm. the more that you're going to see an impact when you change those fibers out. Would you say that's fair? Yeah, exactly. Like the more um, the characteristics of the yarn contribute to the sole of the sweater, like the more you mm -hmm. have to be deliberate and intentional with those um, choices. So let's apply that framework, right? That kind of properties-based framework to B's question. Um, and mm -hmm. you're the cotton queen, Miss Florida. What do you wanna, <laughs> That's true. Do you want to so, tell her what you would do? Yeah, this is what, there's a few questions that I would still have for B in this uh, scenario. One is like, which type of cotton was used? Because we did talk about how like an organic cotton has a lot more body. A Pima cotton is going to be not that different from silk or modal, honestly, because a Pima cotton is much slicker and heavier. Um, silk and modal, I think, will both be a little bit lighter than Pima cotton, but they will yeah. drape similarly. Um, the other thing I would say, though, so like, I would not necessarily sub silk for an organic cotton because the vibe is gonna go from casual, soft, fluffy to like sensual night out evening wear. Maybe and a raw silk. Maybe a raw silk, yeah, which mm -hmm. is nubbier and has more body. Um, you might want to change that aesthetic and if you're thinking of like an evening kind of sexy top, then silk could be the answer for you. But then the last piece of this puzzle is that the mohair, depending on like, is it a lace weight mohair with a fingering weight cotton? Because then the mohair is adding quite a lot of body on its own. And that mohair would still add that body with silk um, or modal. But overall, what I would expect if you're making that sub B is that your top is going to be drapier, is going to hang a little sleeker and have a less, you know, traditional day vibe and more of a like a traditional going out evening type of vibe, um, which could work great if you wanted to wear that top in that context. Do you have anything to add? No. I mean, from a sensory perspective, I'm confused about the initial choice to do cotton and mohair together anyway. You know, for the it downsides good, of yeah. cotton, I'm not sure why you would do that, but I'm curious. Um, I might go look right, into it a little more. <laughs> and the reason that we're saying that is because mohair is so light and fluffy and usually used for a garment that will have a ton of body and cotton is not any of those things. So yeah. these two yarns together are an odd couple. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I'm curious, we'll have to look at this garment and see like what it really looks like. But I imagine that the silk is still, it's just going to be, it's going to be a ton more drape. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so before we get into Jocelyn's um, question and making sure we cover her, uh, I would like to rant about single ply because I feel like this is the last part of the conversation um, in terms of pilling okay. that we need to talk about before we go into it, right? Um, single ply yarns um, haven't been twisted against each other. Right, so you'll see these on sale with um, for sale with dyers. They are um, very satiny. They look like spun clouds. They take dye, particularly yeah. acid dyes, um, incredibly vibrantly. If you're thinking of a slender fingering weight yarn that looks like delicate cotton candy with hot, high saturation, like beautiful colors, you probably are thinking of a single ply. Um, and they're usually pretty soft. They're usually they're very made soft. with like really soft fiber. And there's just, you know, you're not getting any resistance. So it's a it skein that's that hard to leave behind. Cloud. Yeah, it has that cloud feeling. Many 
new knitters, I imagine, knit like their first sweater with single ply yarn. And what do you think happens? I think they cry. <laughs> I think in the long I mean, run, they weep. <laughs> look, y'all, Jen and I actually disagree a little bit on this. I <laughs> knit one of my first sweaters in single ply yarn, and it, it was seamed. It was a seamed okay. sweater. That helps. But I got a lot of wear over a long time out of that sweater, and I did like it. It didn't look quite the same as the sweater in the photo because it had a lot of body, but it was a big oversized sweater and all the body made it like kind of fit in a way that was really cute and I I was a fan yeah so I don't know if I've ever told you this but I worked with a lawyer who called me rigid and analog and when a lawyer calls you rigid and analog I mean you I decided I was just gonna own it right so um I am rigid and I do have rigid opinions on single ply um but well, it but is good to have also, the other perspective you're also like heirloom you know, I want heirloom quality, like couture quality. And, um, and I am not going to call myself trendy because I don't like that word, but I am not as, um, invested in every single one of my knits being like intact for the next hundred years. You're present Although in I the moment. Yeah. Yeah, I'm like, if this is going to be something that I will make good use of, and I see myself making good use of it for many years, that feels sustainable enough for me, and I'm yeah. happy with that, right? Because a single ply sweater is still light years ahead of a fast fashion garment if what you want is a big, floofy sweater. Yeah, yeah. And I think because of my size and shape, I'm somebody who wants more structure in a sweater. So we've gone down this whole like rabbit hole here. Um, we've introduced a lot of um, really beautiful um, room to experiment with how you feel about single ply. But so here are the reasons I don't love them for the types of sweaters that I like to knit for myself. Um, a mm -hmm. single ply, because it hasn't been plied against something else, has all this unreleased twist. And so it will slip to one side, it will bias. So if you start out with a swatch that is a rectangle, you will end up after you block it with a parallelogram, it will look, um, it will twist up into the side. And it will also do that on your body, especially yeah. in areas that don't have structure. So from the underarm to the hem, you might have a massive amount of twisting. I've seen this in people's sweaters. You can also get this with um, high twist yarn. So don't necessarily think that the, the opposite direction is good. A lot of sock yarns that are high twist will also bias because they're taking advantage of that, um, that extra twist with two plies against each other to introduce more tension to reduce pilling and wear, right? So that's, mm -hmm. those are two, two fingering weight yarns that might not be suitable for sock yarns. Um, pilling also like those fibers are going to work their way out. It's going to pill. It's going to pill a lot. So you've got a lot of bias. You've got fragility because the yarn hasn't been spun against itself. Um, yeah. And you've got a slightly different stitch texture because of that too. So for me, I'm somebody who wants a very structured, tailored garment. Um, I have a lot of curves. I feel like they, my body is more harmonious with a structured garment on top and um, a single ply isn't going to work very well for that. But there are ways to deal with this, right? Like, so you have a sweater pattern that uses single ply that I would knit in a heartbeat. Oh, well, thank you. I mean, first of all, all of everything you're saying is completely true, right? So, and then I can be like, well, but I still want to sometimes use a single ply yarn. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which I did in my Sarah pullover. I used a, um, it's a blend of merino and about 25% silk in a single ply and the silk being in there adds some um durability that some tensile strength yeah yeah that the wool on its own does not have and that also means that like while i could still rip that yarn with my hands not as easily so it's going to wear better over time and the sarah pullover is like a very like almost like your favorite long sleeve t-shirt kind of vibe it's got eyelets, lots of them, and that lace adds in some more structure because it adds twist when you do eyelets or any kind of lace stitch. 
and the eyelets get more concentrated around the yoke of this. It's a seamless sweater and the yoke has um, like closer rows of eyelets and they sort of ombre fade out as you go down. So the extra lace around the yoke means that you've got a lot more structure built in yeah. there, right? And at the same time, that sweater does pill, that sweater does hang um, kind of loosely and the body has a little bit less um, or holds its shape a little less than another yarn would. But I knew that that would happen when I designed this sweater and I designed it like for that. It's the yeah, that's part of the soul of it. Like that's who right. she is. Yeah. 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 She's and not a kind she's of not a tight zip I up. Like, yeah. Yeah. I like tuck it into the front of my sweatpants when I go to the grocery store and um, it works really well in that way. It does not yeah. go down past my butt. I keep bringing up butts, not just because um, I like the them. butt episode. We should start with the butt episode. That's good. I honestly don't think this is going to be the butt episode, Jen. I think that <laughs> it's going to be a different episode. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will withhold labeling I mean, this episode we're gonna, the butt episode. <laughs> we're going to have to find out. <laughs> we're going to have to ride this ride and find out. <laughs> but... <laughs> I bring it up because that is high where if you have a sweater or a dress, I love knit dresses. And if they come down over your rump and you're sitting on them, then you're going to be adding a ton of friction, even more friction than you get under the arm. And, and stretch, you don't and stretch, want, yeah. Yeah. You don't want to just wear through the bum of your garment or your dress. So like I would not use a single ply in that situation, but I feel the for, same way about cuffs. Mm -hmm. so they rub on our desks. They rub on our counters. So yeah, high wear areas. Yeah. You're mm -hmm. going, you're just, you're going to pay the price of that. I've knit socks with single ply yarn in the past and, um, they fell apart pretty quickly. Yeah. But they were probably lovely to knit and wear and that's good enough, right? Not they everything so has to soft. be perfect or forever. I mean, yeah. Although I would say I was, I was, it was disappointingly quickly. I would yeah. not recommend high wear areas in knit with single ply yarn, you know, and maybe that even means that you knit a sock with single ply yarn on the foot and the cuff and you change it out for the sole and the heel, which you totally could do if you want. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So let's make sure we answer Jocelyn's question. Um, too long. Didn't listen. The more it resembles angry rope in the skein, the less it's going to pill and the more it resembles a darling pile of fluff the more you're going to end up having to like shave your sweater. Yeah. Which might be okay with you, but if you're trying to minimize it, then you really are looking for those harder wearing crunchier walls that yeah. in a lot of garments I do appreciate, uh, especially like an outerwear garment that is, you're going to wear heavy. Um, yeah. but my neck and chest do not appreciate those necessarily without some serious layers there. Yeah, and if you're somebody who really needs soft yarns and wants sweaters, make a lighter weight sweater so that you can layer it. That's a tactic that I use a lot as somebody with sensory processing sensitivities. Like, go lighter with your yarns so that you can layer it, so that you can make sure that your shirt is never touching your skin. There are ways to do that. So, and that's and helpful. Look and. for garments that use um, some denser stitch patterns so that you can mm -hmm. use your softer yarn and minimize the pilling that way if you want to. Yeah. Um, cool. So my goodness, we there's a million more things to say though. Yeah. Um, and we can't be comprehensive in a conversation that lasts, you know, a reasonable amount of time because this is the lifelong journey. So we've got some resources if you want to learn more. Um, I'll start off. So Clara Parks, Clara Parks, this is, now that you hear me talking, you're going to find out that I know a lot of words through reading and I don't know how to pronounce them necessarily. It's a whole personality type, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The introvert. <laughs> so, so Clara Parks, P-A-R-K-E-S. She has the Knitter's Book of Wool and the Knitter's Book of Yarn that were both released probably in the like 2008 to 2010 era 
and those are incredible resources to teach you all about different types of wool and different fibers, how they're going to react. She talks about pilling, she talks about scales. Um, they're old references, but they really hold up. Uh, I can't believe I'm saying something from 2008 is old, but um, my stepdaughters would say it is, so that's when... where we are. Yeah. So old. <laughs> Um, my tip is to get uh, is to get some hands-on experience, and it's not practical for everybody to grab a whole skein of yarn just to swatch with. So I would say make a little make a little yarn club, get some get some friends together. Everybody buys one skein, get a whole bunch of different stuff, and then cake it up into you know one one ball per person. And everybody makes some little swatches and experiments. Like maybe somebody does one gauge, somebody does another. So get some friends and get some experience so that we have that out there, and then. Let's talk about next week. Tomorrow. Let's yes. talk about tomorrow. Well, right. We have a tomorrow and we have a next week, I think, to talk about, right? Because first of all, tomorrow we've got our second podcast episode launching. This week is exciting and we are treating you to a few episodes. And we're going to be talking about size and shape inclusion. So mm -hmm. could that be the butt episode? That could be the butt episode. I think it might episode. be the bust episode but uh, yeah I think it's gonna be boobs mm -hmm. it's, we got a lot to say it's gonna be juicy so I hope you'll tune in and check us out tomorrow and what about next time we want to hear from yeah. you later this month we are um we're gonna talk about something what is it <laughs> what are we're we gonna, gonna talk, talk about, about? <laughs> I have it here it's gone <laughs> what we wish we knew oh yeah when we first started designing. So, I mean, part of our intention here is to support y'all in your journey. And when, I mean, most of our friendship, I think, was chalked up to the fact that Jen and I were new to garment designing at, for adults, especially like right at the same time. And we were lucky enough to meet and generous enough with each other to help each other out. But there were a lot, I'm going to save it for next week, but there's a lot that I really had no clue about. And I could have saved myself a lot of time if somebody would have, um, had this podcast episode out there. So if you are a new designer or if you've been thinking about designing, we want to help you. So what is it that you feel like you don't know? What are you um, curious about? Do you have questions? hit us up. You can reach out to us really through any channel and we will accept your questions or we have a podcast email, don't we? We do. And we'll put it in the show yeah. notes. You can find our podcast email and links to reach us in the show notes so that you can share what is it that you want to know about designing, especially garment design. And um, you can find out what we have to say a lot next week. Yeah. And if you're a designer and you have something that you wish you'd known, feel free to send us that too. So we can read you out too. Yes. Um, we would love you to share your knowledge with us and uh, anyone listening. So yeah. again, you can find us on our respective websites, on Instagram. We're both on Ravelry and Payhip if you're looking for our patterns. Uh, you can also buy my patterns on my site. The links for our social and our websites and our pattern shops are also in the show notes. And, uh, what else, what do you have going on that you want to share on our way out? Oh gosh. Um, classes right now. I'm really <laughs> focused on classes. There are a couple more slots open for my spring lineup. Um, and you can find those on my website. So if you've been looking to become more knowledgeable about evaluating patterns before you buy them or about um, adding bus shaping to an existing sweater pattern that doesn't have it. Those would be two things that I am really focused on, uh, that are new classes that I'm offering this winter that I would love to have you check out. How about you? Yes. Uh, I've got testing on the brain. I am launching a test this month actually for a cotton tea design. And I am also launching a test for a bralette very soon. I'm really excited about my first bralette. It's been on the burner, on the back burner for quite some time, and I am um, finally getting there. So if you wanna see what's up with that, and if you want to sign up for any of my tests, I really recommend getting on my newsletter um, because that is where first dibs go, and the more popular sizes, 
sometimes, often, do you fill up in that newsletter uh, call out before the test ever goes public. So sign up for my newsletter on my website in the show notes, show notes, show notes. Show notes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we'll, uh, we'll do this again tomorrow. Sound good? We'll be doing this again tomorrow. I can't wait. Thank you all cool. so much for joining. Thanks for coming. See you soon. Happy knitting. Bye.